So, ho, 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 you guys. Uh, yeah, you may be noticing I'm cranking out the videos over the past week. And uh, what that means is I'm totally dirt poor right now because all my students are canceling and blah, blah, blah. And I guess on that note, I should, I should uh, uh, go ahead and uh, promote the idea if you'd like to contribute to my work. You can go to uh, www.paypal.me, M as in Martin and E as in Eric, forward slash Vincognito, and you can contribute to the cause. And uh, who knows? I may be able to make my rent this month. Um, today, I want to talk about the Beatles. What's the big fuss? Why does this guy love the Beatles so much? And why do so many others love the Beatles? I remember one day I was uh, walking down the hallway in my uh, apartment building and my neighbor and I started talking about music and he's much younger. He's got to be about uh, 31, 32. And he said to me, uh, he goes, oh, yeah, I love music, but I don't get this whole thing with the Beatles. And, uh, you know, the thing about if you if you really quotes got the Beatles, if you really get the Beatles, you don't need me here explaining why they were so great. You get it. Uh, however, even even uh, you know younger people like uh, James Corbett, who I consider not only a student but a friend as well, is a big big Beatles fan. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> it's natural for me to especially love people who love the Beatles because they get it and I get it, and I feel like there's a kind of kindred spirit there. Uh, but uh, even someone like James who's really done deep research, he's a great researcher, so he researched the Beatles when he developed a passion for them. Even, even he will uh, not quite get the full feeling of what it was like to be there. And the first thing I would have said but didn't say to my uh, neighbor regarding the Beatles was it has to be understood in context. And if you weren't growing up at that time, you don't understand the profound effect and impact. Now, if you're at all interested in the Beatles, which I don't expect people to be, but if you do have an interest in them, uh, first of all, don't write them off in their early years uh, as, as regards uh, their more bubblegum type cutesy boy band music. It was, maybe it was appealing to the pop sensibility of the time, but I'll tell you something they went way above and beyond what was going on in pop music at the time, especially um, the other British bands that were coming along uh, around that time. Nobody, nobody could beat the Beatles. It was just that simple. And um, so we have to understand the context. Now, if you really, really, really are interested enough to get the context, go to Netflix and uh, look for uh, How the Beatles Changed the World. It's an excellent documentary coming from a whole other perspective than most Beatles documentaries in the sense that what they're really focusing on is how, what an incredible impact they had on the entire fucking planet. These guys couldn't go to India or Pakistan without girls flocking over to them and fans going crazy for them. They affected literally the entire world. Um, there was a, there was a kind of there really was almost a palpable magic to them like they were blessed by the goddess and the goddess said go forth and charm the world with what you got and they managed to do that it's a it's a phenomenon that will never ever happen again and uh, that's one reason why uh, you know I'm I'm glad I lived during the period that I lived in fact there was a meme that went around Facebook like uh, you know if you're if you're regretting your life, don't forget in all the billions of years that you could have been born on this planet, you were born at the time when the Beatles existed. And uh, uh, that made me happy to see. And it's true. I'm so glad I was there to witness the flowering growth and the final wilting of the flower that was the Beatles. Um, but all right, let's get into why the fuss. So let's look at it, the Beatles from like the cultural impact point of view. First of all, um, the haircut was a big thing. OK, the Beatles haircut, you know, bear in mind, this was a time when crew cuts, uh, kind of military style crew cuts or the pompadour, the kind of grease back hair with the wave up top was the thing. If you were if you were streety, you wore the pompadour, if you were like in a street gang and, um, you know, the leather jackets and all that. Uh, but um, 
you know, if you had the typical rigid parents of that day, you would have had a crew cut or uh, at least well-groomed, sh very short cropped hair. So that was considered the sign of wholesomeness in an American, like a wholesome American young boy. Um, so along come these guys. Now, the Beatles, when they were, uh, there's a term teddy boys in England. A teddy boy was like a street ruffian. Those kind of street corner guys that wore the leather jackets and the pompadours and all that. And they, you know, I don't know if you know this, but the, the Brit youth can be extremely violent in compared to American youth. Uh, the British, man, they were pretty mean a lot of people when they were growing up, at least on the street. And you have to bear in mind, too, where they were was Liverpool, a place that was decimated by World War II. Uh, so there was a lot of poverty there, struggle to get work. It was a tough time for them. Any case, uh, you know, you live in Britain, you get the occasion to uh, to travel over to Europe, you know, take a boat or a plane over to Europe, which the uh, continent, and that's what they did. Now, they had some, uh, a mutual friend, John and Paul had a mutual friend in France, Paris, I think it was. And um, this is back in the day before they hit the American shores, but they were already getting big in Britain. They were already... Uh, getting a lot of attention. Uh, the way things were in those days, mass communication wasn't as instantaneous as it is now. So if you have some sort of pop phenom phenomenon happen now, it's just all over the world instantly. Back then, it took a while for things to gain traction. But when you think about that, that it took a lot to gain traction, uh, you know, the Beatles did something remarkable. And I'll get to that in a minute uh, about their coming to the American shores. But anyway, so... Um, they had the, the pompadour, the street, streety kind of funzy hairdos and attitude and that whole thing. And uh, they go to Paris and they meet up with this friend of theirs who was an exe. And uh, that's how much more sophisticated the kids were in those days. An exe was actually an existentialist and they followed the existential philosophies of uh, Sartre and, and uh, the other existential dudes. Um, so you can see right now even that there was a lot of culture behind them and they were very aware and sensitive to this culture. So anyway, the, this buddy of theirs, he had like, you know, bangs and they were like, what's it with this haircut, you know? And, and they probably made fun of it a little. It's like a girl's haircut. He goes, no, no, everybody's, everybody's doing it now. So they decide to get their haircut this way and they come back to England and get back with the band again. And, uh, the guys uh, probably made fun of them and the girls swooned. They loved the new style change with the bangs. It took them a while to uh, convince uh, George and Ringo. In fact, Ringo, I think, was the last one to support a Beatles haircut, what they call this Beatles haircut. So the Beatles were, from the very get-go, very, very culturally aware. America stopped being culturally aware, uh, you know, well, I mean, it, it became less and less culturally aware, but at the height of its cultural awareness, America, you would say like the 40s and 50s, like if you look at the styles, the fashions of the 40s, it's very emulative, if that's a word, it emulates the French styles. And in fact, Americans were kind of competing with the French in terms of being cultured and cool and classy. Now, Americans can't give a shit. They don't care about culture. And that's the way the entire world is going. Art and culture doesn't matter that much. All right. Anyway, so um, so that about the Beatles, they were one point is that they were very culturally aware. It always reflected in the way they dressed. If you look at them through uh, different periods, even from today's lens, looking back the way they dress, they dressed really classy. I mean, they were always aware of looking good and looking sharp. And they had great taste in that, even during the psychedelic phase. Then when the hippies began to go for the Neanderthal look, by that time, then you get to Abbey Road and you have John Lennon looking like he crawled out of a cave. And also Paul McCartney with the big beard and all that. And Paul, George Harrison, forget about it. Uh, I don't like that look at all. I, I really don't like that look. Um, I think it was a sign of the death of the hippie movement, uh, this kind of Neanderthal I don't give a fuck kind of look. Um, anyway, so that's from a cultural viewpoint. Throughout their history, they were very culturally aware. Um, obviously, 
we have to look at the musical viewpoint. Now, the thing that really set the Beatles apart, one thing that actually contributed to their being incredibly good songwriters was first of all, their work ethic. They worked really, really hard. Paul and John, nose to nose, hours at a time, writing songs. And the way they would do it is uh, they didn't have tape recorders, that luxury in those days. So if Paul and John wrote a song and they convened the next day, if they forgot the melody and the chords, they trashed the song. If they remembered the melody and the chords, they kept it. Their logic was, well, if it, if we remember it, it must be have good pop appeal because it, it sticks, right? It's got what they call in the industry a hook. Um, so anyway, one of the, the things was they were listening to guys like Rich, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, uh, Roy Orbison, uh, the Beach Boys, all these American uh, phenomena. Uh, great, great musicians, and uh, part of their cultural awareness, when they progressed on, they became aware of the American genius Bob Dylan, America's, probably America's greatest poet as far as I'm concerned, throughout history. Uh, right underneath him would be uh, Leonard Cohen, who was another incredible poet. Um, so the Beatles were competing. They weren't just liking their heroes and wanting to be like their heroes they were trying to supersede their heroes. So if they heard a Beach Boys song that they thought was killer, like say, um, I'm sure the Beatles were very, very, very inspired by um, Good Vibrations by the Beach Boys. And if you give that, give that song a close listen, that is a remarkable piece of music. It took uh, Brian Wilson, God, like 10 months to get that song finished. Um, and he had full access to the wrecking crew. He told them every note they should play. He, he had a clear idea of every single note and the way it should be played. So, all right, so they, they're not only competing with their heroes, they want to supersede and be better than their heroes. But then, they if John came out with a great song, Paul wanted to supersede it. Like it's been said that the song Good Day Sunshine by Paul on the Revolver album, you know, Happy Sunshine song, uh, John Lennon's answer to that was good morning, good morning off the Sgt. Pepper records. So they were competing with each other, trying to outdo each other for different vibes and different songs and trying to do better than each other were doing. And there was a time that Lennon was really, McCartney couldn't top him, especially in the early days. McCartney did great work in the early days, but Lennon was the king of the Beatles for the first half of their life. Uh, then uh, McCartney became, they, I have an image in mind, like if you picture McCartney down here and Lennon down here, I mean up here, there's Lennon, here's McCartney. In the early days, it was like this. During the middle period, say around Help, Revolver, they're meeting. And then as you go to the later and later periods, McCartney, McCartney begins to eclipse John Lennon. John became lazy and distracted by other things. He didn't care that much about being a Beatle, which is really sad, but I get it. I mean, they were a product. Uh, they were a corporate product, unfortunately, and that's the way it was. So, all right, so you have their icons that they're trying to supersede. Then you have each other that they're trying to beat out the other one. But not only that, they took it even a step further. They had to outdo themselves. In other words, if Paul wrote yesterday, which was considered to be a, a great, great work of a pop song. Uh, a lot of McCartney's years was, was spent trying to beat yesterday, do better than yesterday. And you could take a song like um, Here, There, and Everywhere as his way of trying to do better than yesterday. Um, and in fact, there's a similar chord change in that song as there is to, uh, uh, to the song Yesterday. Um, a two five to uh, uh, two five to six, major two five to six, which is a very nice sound. Um, all right, so that so you have this constant having to do better, having to do better, having to do better. All right. Um, getting back to the cultural awareness thing, their very first album cover was a sign of how culturally hip they were. Um, Jane Asher, which was Paul's early girlfriend, was also very culturally aware, and she was a, a, a kind of an artsy photographer. And uh, she used to take these portraits of John and Paul and George and Ringo 
up in the attic and they were always in this kind of dark half light black and white photos where there's a shadow on one side of the face. So what did the Beatles do when they came out with their first record, uh, Meet the Beatles? They said to the record company, we want something like her photographs. You know, we want that kind of look where there's a shadow on half of our faces. And so they produced that. Uh, a couple of the other album covers after that were really shoddy and commercial and very American made. Um, the Americans also completely destroyed the, the flow of Beatles work. This is capitalism and stupid mindedness of corporate heads, but uh, uh, capital and uh, capital records in America released Beatles albums that um, they changed the orders of things and they took things from other albums and chucked them on there with no regard for the fact that this was a synergistic whole, all the songs were placed in a certain way for a certain reason in order to sound good. Um, but uh, that that's America for you, just like totally disregarding art. The Europeans always, even to this day, have much more respect for art and music than Americans ever will. And if Americans don't fucking wake up to the importance of art and music, they might as well be buried now, quite honestly, uh, quite honestly, really. The obnoxiousness of American capitalism is just over the top. All right, so uh, we have uh, this cultural uh, cultural awareness, and whenever a new artist arose that they liked, they again would would emulate and try to supersede that artist. All right. Um, another thing that's remarkable about the Beatles is they'll try something once; they'll just do it one time. And it could be fucking great, 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 great. But they won't say, oh, on this new song, let's do that again because it sounded so good. That's how much integrity they had. And every composer should be like that. Try to supersede yourself to do better than you already did. I'll give you some examples of this. Um, the uh, two-part guitar solo, this beautiful arabesque on um, uh, And You A Bird Can Sing off the Revolver album. That was a two-part guitar harmony. The Beatles only did that once, and it's a beautiful long thought of a melody. And um, one of these other videos, I'm going to talk about the long thought uh, regarding melody and, and also harmony. Um, and, you know, you take a band like the Allman Brothers, they made a career out of harmonizing two guitars. The Beatles did it once. That's how classy they were. And now, uh, you know, one of the things I haven't discussed is the influence of blues and also gospel on American music. But in gospel churches, there was something called the call and response. The leader would sing a, a, a lyric, and after he sang it, the audience would sing that lyric back. So it would be an echo. And this is um, this tradition greatly influenced America, American music. Now it's considered corny, but if you take the song... Um, uh, California Dreamin' by the Mamas and the Papas. Papas, you got all the leaves are, all the leaves are brown. So you have one guy singing all the leaves are brown and then the chorus sings on top of it. Now, if you, the Beatles did this in space, they did a lot of it. Um, but then on the song Help, they do a reverse call and, and response and they only do this once. What do I mean by a reverse call and response? Uh, the background singers will be the ones to start the beginning of a phrase, and then John will fill out the phrase. So they sing when, and John sings when I was younger, so much younger than today. Um, so it's it's a reverse call and response. The backup singers normally come in after the line is, is sung. And in this case, the backup singers give you a hint to the line, and then the main singer sings it. That was the first that was never done again. And I could cite stuff like this over and over and over and over. Uh, so many Beatles songs have these innovations, remarkable innovations that were done once and never done again. Uh, when we get into, when we get up to Rubber Soul, they're still touring by now, but now they're starting to get the idea that the recording studio itself can be um, a viable instrument or a means of expression. In other words, it wasn't just there to take down the music and that's that. They started to mess with uh, tape loops and reverse, uh, reversing the tape and speeding up the tape and slowing down the tape. Um, 
this happened pretty early on too in uh, Rubber Soul. There's a song uh, in my life, and uh, what George Martin did was he uh, wrote this Bach-like uh, piano part, but he didn't have the chops to really play it at the tempo that the song was. And when you take a tape and and uh, play it, a uh, magnetic tape at half speed, and you play at that speed, what's going to happen is when you bring it back up to its normal speed, it's going to play twice the speed and also an octave higher than it was recorded at. And that's where you get that kind of harpsichord sound from the piano in, uh, in my life. Uh, so they were messing with tape speeds um, like that. Now the Beatles, the thing about the Beatles were socially, they were always one step ahead of the trend. They were hippies before hippies happened. You know, they they kind of let's put it this way: when a Beatles album came out, one one guy said this: uh, when a Beatles album came out, we were looking to that to see, oh, what direction are we supposed to go in now? The Beatles were literally like leading the way, like a signpost for the culture to follow in. Um, now when. Now, what else makes the Beatles remarkable? It's an endless list. I could make a three-part series out of this, quite honestly. But let's uh, let's look at um, the progression, their evolution, and the speed of their evolution. In 1963, they hit the American shores with I Want to Hold Your Hand, She Loves You, all those cute pop songs, which are still, uh, from a theory perspective, remarkable. Uh, that's why I say, you know, if you like the Beatles, don't just listen to their psychedelic stuff and beyond. You should go to the early work and look at it very closely because there's a lot going on in there that any contemporary composer would be proud of themselves if they came up with what they came up with back in those days. The fact, again, it's almost like a disguise that it's pop music and it's kind of like cute pop music when in fact, the sophistication of the chord progressions, even in those early years, was just remarkable. Uh, the way George Harrison kind of put it was that, well, you know, by the time the Beatles got popular, John and Paul had written already written all of their bad songs. So they didn't have a bad song left to write. In other words, they put in there 10,000 hours uh, to make mastery happen. Um, and, you know, that's what made them great as a band, too. You know, they worked eight, ten hours a day in Hamburg, and just got tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And they were a pretty decent live performing band, as far as I see. Uh, but, you know, if you, they hit American Shores in 1963 with these pop, I want to hold your hand, blah, 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 blah. You go to uh, about 1965, late 1965, you get uh, Rubber Soul. And then in 66, you get Revolver, where John Lennon is now quoting the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, um, well, let's say they changed their lyrical content in those days. They were turned on by Dylan to the idea that, you know, you don't have to write. They were under the impression to be a pop artist, it must be a love song that you write. And uh, so if you look at their body of early work, everything was a love song, except for a couple of, you know, kind of, uh, novelty songs like Matchbox and things like this. But basically, it was all love songs. Uh, if you go to Rubber Soul, then you start to see a kind of warping of the love song in, in something like Norwegian Wood. And uh, yeah, I could demonstrate it, but I won't. Um, in those days, you know, you took it. Eh, maybe I'll demonstrate. Hang on one second. In those days, see, I got a standard D chord here. In those days, this was a big deal to go. So, you know, a lot of composers, uh, homespun composers, were using that guitar trick. What does Lennon do to a D chord? Watch this. There is an example of the restlessness and ingenuity of these guys. Uh, always trying to supersede. John sees, oh, they're doing a sus to it. Well, he didn't know the language, but 
they're doing a sus2 and a sus4 and a d chord. I'm going to expand that idea. I'm just going to go bananas on a d chord. This is the kind of thing that I recommend every composer do. Stretch your limits. Go beyond your boundaries. Listen for something you never heard before on your writing. You know, this is so freaking important. Um, especially now, uh, you know, composition is a dismal affair nowadays. So in any case, uh, my point being that from between within three years time, they go from the cute pop song to these heavy weight themes like, uh, uh, tomorrow never knows. And, and, uh, 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 she Said, She Said, which is a song about an acid trip, a bad acid trip that John Lennon had. Dr. Robert, about a uh, scandalous doctor in Manhattan that would uh, give his clients vitamin B12 shots along with uh, methadrine, which is basically speed and uh, that sort of thing. So uh, the Beatles were just right on the cutting edge of everything. And so whenever they came out with an album, we looked toward them like, okay, where, where are we headed now? Where are we headed now? So you can imagine it was such a disaster when the Beatles broke up in our spirits, all of our spirits, because the Beatles were kind of a shining light through the darkness of the 60s. There was a, a good time and a bad time in the 60s. The late 60s brought us 68, which was just awful. And of course, we had the uh, murder of President Kennedy by the powers that be, and then they murdered his brother as well, and they murdered Martin Luther King. Because why? Because they can. Um, but don't get me started on that. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, the cultural context. I mean, we're, we're talking about very uptight times, and the Beatles broke through that uptightness and said, here, try this, here, try this, here, try this. Uh, we love them. They were loved around the world. I have a theory that uh, the, the, especially the young girls, they would literally cream over the Beatles and into an orgasmic ecstasy watching them, and uh, which was a detriment to their live performance because all you could hear was a scream. But uh, I have a theory that all these women just opened their hearts and sent out gads of love out into the open air toward the Beatles. But then it was the Beatles couldn't hold that love. And it's the love just spread around the world. So I believe that the vibration of love just kept coming out and coming out and coming out. And uh, so it culminated in 1967, the summer of love, the infamous summer of love. And uh, yeah, yeah. Of course, that's kind of a spiritual notion. I don't know how true it is, but I do believe in vibes and vibrations. I really do. If you can hear music and you can't see it, there are such things as vibrations, aren't there? Uh, let me see if there's any other points I wanted to touch on. Um, you know, I don't think so. Uh, I just wanted to make this uh, little video. I think I, I mentioned that I went to see the appropriately titled show Love that was uh, by Cirque du Soleil that was an homage to the Beatles and literally a tear came to my my, my, my eye because uh, I these guys deserve the respect and love that they get. And I, I always say the one thing that the Beatles accomplished that no composer in the past and no composer in the future uh, will ever accomplish is that they turn the world onto love and nobody else can claim that. Only maybe Jesus Christ or Buddha. So um, it was a great time to be alive. And I do miss those boys quite a bit. And when I say that, I mean them as a synergistic unit. While I do believe that Paul McCartney had a couple of great records. Actually, he still, every once in a while, he came out with something good. But I think his pinnacle was the Ram album, which is two records after the Beatles broke up. Uh, same with John. I, I lost interest in him after when that uh, New York City record came out. I was done with John Lennon. I just didn't like it. But the first two records are good. Uh, Plastic Ono Band and Imagine. Same with George. All Things Must Pass was good. Uh, the one after that, I forget the name of it. Might have been Dark Horse. I'm not sure. But uh, it was okay. But then he progressively got worse and worse. I can't tolerate the Traveling Wilburys. I think it's the most dorky music I've ever heard. Um, 
and McCartney's written a quite quite a few dork fests. Like, dude, come on, really? Ebony and Ivory, really? Magneto and Titanium Man, come on, dude, really? But you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. See, the Beatles' genius was as a unit. They their competition with each other and their at a strange combination of teamwork and competition at the same time. Um, they were very egalitarian. Whoever had the best idea, even if it was George or Ringo, if they had a good idea, that's what went into the song because it was the song that meant the most. It wasn't their separate egos. That happened after they got older and realized, I believe their downfall really began when they stopped touring because now they had time to think and they had time to complain about each other and see their each other's character faults and had time to start to resent each other. And that was a very, very sad thing. In fact, one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of the White Album has nothing to do with the music so much, although I think it could have been produced a hell of a lot better than it was. And I think George Martin agreed with me on that one. But not only that, um, it was the spirit of the record. I felt the way John Lennon put it is quite right. During the White Album, uh, we each became a band leader and the, ba the Beatles became the backup band for that band leader. So it wasn't John and Paul and George and Ringo working together to mold one song really well. It was John getting on the sound stage and saying, okay, here's the song, do it this way. Great. I love it. And there wasn't as much input and uh, creativity put into it. I could hear animosity in the lyrics, very subtle digs at each other. Um, I could sense that they weren't spiritually, as one anymore. And it was very disheartening. I love those guys. I love those guys as a team. I would say my favorite period of the Beatles is the span uh, from Hard Day's Night on up to um, maybe Magical Mystery Tour. After that, yes, Abbey Road was a masterpiece, no question. Uh, um, but basically, like in terms of their unity as a band. I, I like the periods from uh, Hard Day's Night. My watershed albums are Meet the Beatles, Hard Day's Night, Help, Rubber Soul, Revolver, Peppers, and um, Magical Mystery Tour. Eh, I'm not, you know, it's the problem with Magical Mystery Tour. I was thinking about this today. They had a habit of, you know, back in those days, the record companies would never let you put a single on a record. So the single was separate from your album. And uh, how eventually those rules changed and the Beatles began putting their singles on their records. So uh, uh, was it Strawberry Fields, I think it was, or uh, on, on uh, Magical Mystery Tour, uh, or I Am the Walrus. Yeah, I Am the Walrus was on Magical. The singles became like part of the album and I felt kind of ripped off. Like, yeah, I, I wish you guys had done a whole album. So Magical Mystery Tour, I'm kind of this way and that about, there's some great stuff, but I kind of wish it was more cohesive Beatles record. Anyway, that's me going on. You cannot understand the Beatles if you don't understand the cultural context. And even if you can conceptualize the cultural context, you can't still quite get it. You had to be there. It's that simple. You had to be there. But by no exaggeration, the Beatles on a consistent basis changed and influenced the world. They taught the world to feel love, which was remarkable. And, uh, yeah, I miss those days. It was the times we had hope back then. There's no hope now. Doesn't look like it. All right, you guys. So be well. I'm always ending my videos on a negative note, it seems. But, uh, you know, whatever. Hope you're enjoying the holidays and see you soon. Bye.